Hello, meteorology. Gosh, chapter seven took three videos because there were some ideas that took a lot of cogitating and talking about in that chapter. About time for an easy chapter, isn't it? You got it. Chapter eight is probably the easiest chapter since, I'd say about since chapter one. Chapter five wasn't too bad. Yeah, this one is about air masses. Now, I like this picture. It's the Great Lakes. It shows lake effects, snow and clouds forming. It's actually kind of spectacular. Uh, you ought to give it a good look in your own book. But it involves a continental polar air mass traversing a warm body of water and causing lake effect snow. See, I just had some adjectives that went in front of air mass. Now, let's talk about this. What the heck? In fact, look at the name of Section 8.1. What is an air mass? Is it an air parcel? Kinda, but bigger. An air mass is a large region of air, a big, big body of air. I'm usually talking several hundred miles across, maybe even a thousand or two or three thousand miles across. It's a big bunch of air. Um, Depth-wise, it's usually, I mean, the air itself is however many miles deep the atmosphere is, you know, fades out as it goes up. Usually with air mass, we're talking about kind of the lower half of the atmosphere, maybe the lowest mile or two of the atmosphere, and an area spanning hundreds of miles or so, and tens of thousands of square miles. But um, it has fairly common, fairly uniform, distinctive, separable from other air masses, characteristics. And the two characteristics we really are talking about are temperature and humidity. Those are the two things that count. In other words, you can have a hot air mass or a cold air mass, or an in-between. You can have a humid air mass or a dry air mass, or in-between. But of course, when we categorize things, we don't use in-between much. We usually like, I mean, you're gonna come up with a system, you're gonna probably do, obviously this is what you're gonna do. You're going to have a little box and it's gonna have pretty much four things. Um, maybe going uh, down the side, maybe on temperature. And the temperature could be cold or warm, or maybe even hot, or maybe cool. But, you know, those are your two kinds of, kinds of temperatures. And in terms of humidity, there's two kinds. There's dry and moist, or wet, or humid, humid, something like that. So th those are the four kinds of air masses you could have. Now, how would it get these various ways? Why would some air get to be warm and humid? Why would it do that? Probably because of where it lives, because of where it grew up. More on that in a second. More on it right now. A, uh, a bunch of air that's sitting out over the Bermuda Triangle, out over the subtropical Atlantic Ocean, Maybe in the summer, maybe not in the summer. Anyway, it's it's tropical. It's warm. It's humid. And that air is going to obviously soak up moisture, evaporating off the ocean. The sun's beating down, making everybody warm. Of course, it's a warm, humid air mass. It lives over the Bermuda Triangle, you know. Um, why would you have a cold, dry one? That would probably be from a high latitude, close to the poles, or at least you know, pretty far north, pretty far south, and probably over land, because over land, it would have no reason to be too wet, would it? Be fairly dry. So you could have a cold, dry air mass. Hey, you could also have a warm, dry air mass. It probably came from Arizona, the desert, you know, except during the monsoon season, it wouldn't be quite that dry. But generally speaking, desert air masses would be warm and dry. And then finally, you could have a cool, moist air mass, probably too cold, because if it's too cold, the ocean will freeze. And if it freezes, it's hard for that water vapor to get in the air. So you could have kind of a chilly air mass coming off, say, from a little south of Alaska or from the far north Atlantic, you know, east of Greenland or something like that. That would be cold and wet, cold and moist. So that's the kind of four sorts of air masses you might expect. How do you get air to get that way? I'm going to use an analogy. I love this analogy. Accents. I still, I, I kind of have an accent. I don't know. It's not too strong. But basically, 
when I hear, um, hear me as a kid on a tape recorder, I sound like, well, heck, I'm proud of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I have a strong Southern accent. I maybe lost a little bit of it, but you can still hear it some. Why would I have a Southern accent? Because I grew up in the South. That's why. I hung around here all this time. Now, generally speaking, you preserve your accent pretty well when you move. Um, but it can change a little bit. Sometimes it can change a lot. One example, I had a student who I taught back in the 90s um, come back to see me. He walked in, he maybe looked a little familiar, I couldn't quite dredge up his name, but he started talking, totally threw me off. He had a strong Irish accent. I'm not even gonna try to do an Irish accent. I mean, like, who the heck is this Irishman that just walked into my room? Well, actually, he was the same guy I taught, and he used to probably, I don't know if he had a southern accent, but it sure wasn't Irish. He went to Ireland, lived there for like 15 years, and absorbed their accent. Um, my wife's family is a little bit interesting accent-wise. Here's kind of what happened with them. Um, her dad was from the south and moved up north, up to Chicago, met her mom, and they got married up there and had kids. And... My wife was a middle child, and when they all moved back down here, thank goodness they moved down here, right? Um, she reached age four in Chicago. Her older brother and sister were as old as like 10 or more, and her younger ones were almost like just a little baby. Um, and so they is, have a spectrum of accents. The oldest one has noticeable chicago -y sound, with the, but she says y'all. Um, by the time you get to the youngest one, he's as southern as anybody. You know, because their exposure. Exposure, that's what it's all about. So if some air lives for a long time in a warm, humid place, it will become a warm, humid air mass. And if it ever moves away from home, which is why this gets interesting, if it ever moves away from home, it will be slow to adopt a new accent. But not never. Maybe not as much as my student who turned Irish. But, you know, it might change some. So where do air masses form? Well, it's got to be some place where they're allowed to live a long time. Can't be an army brat, you know, who's moving all the time from base to base. No, it's got to be somebody who lives a long time in the same place, which happens in two major regions of the world. It happens in the subtropical high pressure belts, the horse latitudes, where people have to throw the horses overboard and let them swim for on their own, you know, out in the seaweed. I told you about that. Um, it happens there where the wind is fairly calm. It also happens near the poles um, at high latitudes where you're also under high pressure. So high pressure with weak light winds allows air to spend enough time over a certain type of surface and condition. Um, so it takes on strong accents, a warm, humid accent, a cold, dry accent, for example. Now, it wouldn't really be probably very much worth studying air masses if it weren't that they move. And you know what? If if everybody had their own local accent, southern accents, you know, Bronx accent, whatever you talk about, Brooklyn, um, British, it wouldn't be that interesting if you never met them or if they never moved. It's when they move that it gets interesting. Okay, so obviously we can be invaded by Northern air masses that are cold and dry and they make it really weird here because they still keep some of their cold, dry accent. Then we can be invaded by warm, moist air masses and get their experience, you know. We get to taste different kinds of air. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, that's stupid. We get to taste different kinds of air here because we live in a very cosmopolitan part of the world called the Westerlies. In the Westerlies, Stuff's a changing all the time. There's like low pressure systems in the subpolar low belt, you know, that swing fronts through. We're going to learn about fronts in the next chapter. And the air's all getting stirred up, mixed up. And again, I said cosmopolitan, you know, it's worldly, whatever. There's all kind of crazy air masses coming through here. It's a big transportation hub, you know, kind of like Atlanta is with the airport and all. Um, and Atlanta starts with railroads. So, yeah, we live in a kind of happening sort of place in the world where we get to meet air from all over the place. Um, so we need nomenclature 
by which I mean, you know, like jargon. Look, those are pretty good words right there. Uh, actual names for these things. So they don't just say cold and warm and dry and moist. They actually got some names for it. They, they, they call the cold ones, they call them polar. Polar, get it? Cold from the pole. They call the warm ones T for tropical because they come from like the horse latitudes. And dry, they call it, and they use a small, lower, for some reason they use a lowercase letter for the humidity things and an uppercase letter for the temperature things. And they always write the humidity before the temperature. So, so it's like um, this is continental, continental, like, you know, dry. And this one is maritime, maritime meaning from the ocean, mariners and marines and, you know, whatever, ocean stuff. So um, maritime, and the letter for that is M. So the, the names of these air masses are CP, um, this is still cold, cold and moist, so what do you think? MP, then down here we have CT, and we have MT. Those are your four basic air masses. Now, before I start saying what air masses come from where and who we experience and who other people experience and stuff like that, um, I think I should tell you there's actually another couple of air masses you could talk about. One that you could refer to is equatorial air masses because you can have air masses that live at the equator. But we're not going to, really. And the letter for them is E for equatorial. But we don't talk about them because they never come here. Can you think about why equatorial air masses never come here? Let me get my globe. Hang on. Why do equatorial air masses never come here? Because they lie in the intertropical convergence zone. Air is always converging on the equator. It's like everybody, you know, air comes in from around there, but it doesn't go anywhere. Air doesn't leave the equator. It's a convergence zone. So um, we don't talk about equatorial air. However, here, here's something else that happened. After they'd already named these things, apparently somebody said, like, you know, some of that, Polar air is really cold. It's like we already got a name for it, cold air, cold dry air. Yeah, but I mean, some of it's really, really cold. We need another name. You know, like you make a drink that's even bigger than large, you got to give it, you know, super or whatever you call it, or whatever they do at Starbucks. Can't get that straight anyway. Um, so what they did, they needed another word that sounded cold, and they picked Arctic. So there's also, I should have put it maybe down here, there's also really cold Colder than just cold, and so they call that Arctic, and they got continental Arctic here. Um, now, is there any such thing as maritime Arctic? Not in this country, we don't talk about maritime Arctic, but over in England, they'll talk about that stuff. They'll talk about it in England and the Netherlands, even though we don't think it exists, but uh, more on that in a, in a minute. Um, the word Arctic actually, to me, honestly, doesn't sound as cold as the poles. If I were making this stuff up, I'd have said the coldest stuff comes from the poles and the Arctic is just near the poles and that wouldn't be quite as cold. But no, 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 they'd already called things polar. And then they'd already used that word and they couldn't go back and change what it meant. So when they found air that was colder than polar, they just called it the next best thing, Arctic. Now, why isn't there, according to me, and most U.S. meteorology, you know, weather people, why isn't there maritime Arctic? Because if it's ever cold, really, really cold, arctic -y cold, the ocean will be frozen. And if the ocean is frozen, it might as well be land because very little water comes off the ice. You're kind of trapped there like an elbows and all the molecules are. So, so maritime arctic is a word we don't use. Um, I'll, I'll talk when I get to talk about England here in a minute. I'll, I'll talk about why they would say that. But anyway, so here's the air masses. And which ones do we get to witness? Who, who comes... Who comes through these parts here in Atlanta? Well, I think you maybe sort of know. Maybe. What sounds more common to you? Warm and muggy or warm and dry? To me, warm and muggy. It's warm and muggy a lot here, like all summer long. That's maritime travelers. We get a lot of maritime travel over here. What about um, cold air? 
Is it very often cold and wet? Well, yeah, if it's raining, but, but the rain's kind of an exception. I mean, the rain falls into the air and changes it. It gets it all wet. But um, so really, to me, cold goes with dry. I get my lips all chapped. It's not just because it's cold, it's because it's dry. I get shot touching the doorknob and everything when it's cold because it's dry. So these two air masses are the ones who hit us a lot. And actually, honestly, so does continental Arctic sometimes. Though really, we barely got any continental Arctic here this last winter. Maybe one or two shots. They weren't very impressive. They only got down maybe 22. Sure enough, Arctic air here gets us down to like 10, you know, 15, something like that. That's typical Arctic air. The polar air is the stuff that gets us in down to like 28, 25, 28 at night, 40s in the daytime, something like that. Cold, but not bitterly cold. Um, of course, you know, air gets modified as it travels, so it was colder where it came from, but it still has a good bit of its accent when it arrives. Um, so we get these. We rarely get continental tropical air because, like, where the heck would we get it from? It's all about geography, you know. We're not going to get continental tropical air much because it would have to come from, like, Arizona and northern Mexico. That's about the only place that's going to have continental tropical in our hemisphere, um, in this part of our hemisphere. So we're, we're just, this is too far away. We just don't get that stuff. What do we get? We get air flooding up off the Gulf of Mexico. It's all warm and humid. So that's maritime tropical. Sometimes we get air from the Bermuda Triangle area here and it floods in and so it's warm and humid. What about cold air? Our cold air comes from Canada, sorry, Canada, um, or even from the north, even sometimes from Siberia. If it's up from up here, it's Arctic. If it's just from like Saskatchewan or North Dakota, eh, we call it polar. So, so that air is dry because it's over land. And I know this is water, but in the winter, it's frozen anyway. So that's all we get. Warm and humid, cold and dry, not much else. But this is different for different places. Let's talk about, say, um, for example, California. In California, you can get warm, humid air. Now, it's not as warm and humid as here because they got that cold ocean current. That kind of like changes it. You're probably going to get foggy, you know, advection fog if it happens. But you can get warm and humid. If the wind comes up from the south, you can get maritime tropical air up over California, and it can be warm and humid, just not quite as humid as here. You can definitely get continental tropical because the air can blow from Arizona or Nevada or even northern Mexico into Los Angeles or San Francisco. It's the wrong direction for the wind to go, kind of, because usually you know, the westerlies, and it usually goes west to east in the middle latitudes, but not always, and sometimes it turns around, and they do get Santa Ana winds. That's one of those local winds, actually. They're strong, dry, hot winds they'll get. So they get kind of tropical. They also get maritime polar from up in here. Maritime polar air is cool and moist. It's not especially cold. It can't be too cold because it's over water and the water is above freezing. I'm talking about air that in its source region might be like 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 35, 40 degrees. And it moves in to California. It's a little warmer than that, but it's like 50 and humid, you know. So that's maritime polar. So they get maritime polar and maritime tropical and some continental tropical. Do they get continental polar or continental arctic. Not very well for two reasons. One reason is it forms up in here and usually, I mean, it might move south, but it moves kind of eastward. It doesn't head there way much. That's kind of backwards. Now, I did say continental tropical air could get there from the east occasionally, but continental arctic has a tough time making it to the west coast because not only does it have to go in the wrong direction because of unusual weather patterns, but it also is dense, heavy, and has a heck of a time trying to climb the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. So in other words, the mountains shield the West Coast from very much continental uh, polar or continental arc here. It can seep through the valleys and passes and get in here a little bit, but it's kind of a shadow of its former self when it does. Oh, let's pick other places. England! Well, they get in England. Okay, in England, they can get maritime tropical. It has to make kind of a long trip up from here. 
you know, if it goes to Spain or something, but it does. It can get warm and a bit humid, not muggy like Atlanta, but it can get warm and humid there sometimes if the air comes up like that. Maritime tropical, maritime polar, that's their life. Maritime polar is always streaming off like south of Iceland and comes in, and it's kind of chilly. It's like 39 degrees or something in the winter and 52 in the summer or whatever, but they get that kind of air flowing in off the ocean and it's cool and moist. And so mostly in London, you go back and forth between cool, moist, and warm, moist. Maritime polar, maritime tropical, because the wind's usually from the west and the ocean's west of them. Can they get continental tropical? Uh, where are they going to get it from? Sahara Desert? Sahara Desert Air has a tough time making it to England. Maybe just a shadow of its former self can make it. It can be a little bit hot and dry, but not that much because it's got too much in between. Um, what about cold, dry air? Can you get continental polar air? Yeah, you can, sort of. It's got to go the wrong way from Russia to arrive in England, but to do that, First of all, it's going the wrong way, and it has to cross the North Sea. And while crossing the North Sea, it's kind of like moving to Ireland for a little bit, your accent might change. So actually, their version of continental polar air is sort of muted. It's, it's not quite as cold because it passed over somewhat warmer water. It's cold, but not quite as cold. And it um, also has moistened up some. It might just snow or something instead of um, being cold and dry. London, for example, is way further north than where. It's 52 degrees north of the equator. And here we are at 34 degrees north of the equator in Atlanta. And we've had temperatures historically as low as 9 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. London, depending on what part of London, it's never been colder than maybe somewhere between 12 and 16 Fahrenheit. It doesn't get very cold there because they have a hard time getting continental polar in there. How about continental Arctic? It would have to come from the frozen ice cap, and it can try. Here's where their name, okay, see what, what happens is this. You'll get air from Greenland, which is really, really cold, because the ice cap there, all bright and shiny, not water, it's frozen water. Uh, the ice cap or Greenland ice cap, you get some seriously cold air. If it came down this way, we'd call it continental Arctic. But when it goes that way, it passes over all this Atlantic Ocean right here several hundred miles of Atlantic Ocean there, it passes over, and it really gets its accent changed. It's not that cold anymore. It's only maybe about freezing, and it's moistened up. So they call it Maritime Arctic, because it was from the Arctic, but it's really changed a lot. It's like saying somebody sounds like they're from New York when they just were there as a kid, and they've lived in South Carolina for the last 10 years. You know, so it's, it's toned down a little bit. Anyway, they call it maritime Arctic. Oh, other places. China. What do they get in Shanghai? Oh, they certainly can get maritime tropical. It can be warm and humid with air coming up off the South China Sea or out in the Pacific here. Warm and humid, definitely in the summer. Lots and lots of that. Almost a monsoon of that stuff coming up. And they sure as heck can get continental polar. It forms out over here over Siberia. It comes pouring down. And sometimes it's pretty cold. You can get continental Arctic air move into that area, and it does, and it's quite cold. It maybe is slowed down a little bit by a few mountain ranges, I feel, in right here. Uh, whereas for us, straight shot, just one teeny bit of Appalachians up around Chattanooga, and that's about the only thing trying to slow down cold air from reaching us. Here, a couple of obstacles, but it can stick a pretty cold. So you see the kind of air they get. Oh, let's pick another place. Australia. What do they get and say, Adelaide, Australia, right here? Oh, now this is interesting. Quite different from us. You see, Adelaide is on a poleward facing coast. Antarctica's out here. Antarctica's got the coldest air in the world. But it don't matter a whole lot when it just had to pass 2,000 miles of open water on the way to you. Yo, it comes from there. But by the time it gets to you, it's warmed up considerably. It's also moistened up on the bottom and kind of gotten unstable, but it's cool moist air. Continent? No, no, not continental. No, no. Maritime polar. I hope I've been saying that. Yeah, I just said it right. 
maritime polar air comes flooding up into Adelaide and it's cool and moist. Same thing in Melbourne and Sydney can get it too. Maybe Perth. You know, all, the, all these areas can get maritime polar air, which is cool and moist, but not particularly cold. They can also very definitely get continental tropical air from the outback, the red center of Australia. It's kind of subtropical and dry. I'm glad it's hot. It's a desert. It's a big old orangish reddish desert. And they can get winds come out of the area that are hot and dry, significantly hot. You can get up to like 114 degrees on the coast of Australia when that happens. Um, Sydney, pretty much the same thing. However, Sydney being on the east coast is more susceptible to getting some maritime tropical air. So Sydney can be warm and humid, or it can be cool and humid, or it can be hot and dry. What's the one thing Sydney never is? Cold and dry. Not very cold anyway. Adelaide rarely even gets warm and humid. They're usually either cool and humid or hot and dry because of the way they face the coast and everything. So everybody's got its own kind of air. One more I'll talk about because I've been there. Let's check out Argentina. Now, I've, I've visited my friend down here in Bahia Blanca, right, right there. See? See where that is? Argentina. What kind of air do they get? Well, they can get maritime tropical air from up here. Nah, not a lot. It's not really warm and humid a whole lot there. Kind of. They definitely get maritime polar. I was in some maritime polar air down there, streaming right up out of this way. May have started in Antarctica, but um, you know, it was moistened up a whole lot, and it was weird. It was like 38 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit with thunderstorms. It's just weird. And that was maritime polar air streaming up from this direction. They could get maritime polar air from over here, but Misty Mountain, the Andes mess with this stuff. It takes air that was cool and moist from this area off the Pacific here. It takes cool, moist air, wrings the moisture out on the slope, western slopes of the Andes in Chile, and it comes back down, and it's weird. It's a different kind of air. It's warmer because, you know, Cactus County, but it wasn't that warmer in the, it wasn't that warm in the first place. So it ends up being sort of coolish, medium temperature air and rather dry. So they can get this slightly cool, like in the 50s, dry air. Can they get any really cold air? Think about the way they get the coldest they'd ever get. It's tricky. It's real tricky. If you can get some air to come from Antarctica and come right up over the tip of South America and go right up the spine of that steak piece sticking off South America there, you can get pretty cold. They can get colder than like equivalent latitudes in Australia, but not, not too far. So um, those are our basic air masses and who they involve. And let's see what else there is to say. I've classified them nicely, except for one thing I got to throw in. Oh, we got properties of North American air masses, all that kind of thing. There's one more thing. Um, and that is air masses, when they pass over a new region, they contrast some with the existing surface. For example, um, you could have, say, maritime tropical air travel up over Georgia in the winter. And when it does, it gets chilled on the bottom because it's all nice warm air and it gets cold from the surface. Maybe it even snowed here. That's not common, but, but it, it, sometimes it has. And so if it gets chilled on the bottom, it gets very stable because it's cooler near the surface than it is up higher and air parcels don't want to go up and down. So you can stabilize the air a great deal by passing it over a colder surface. However, that same air mass, maritime tropical, in the summer gets up over Atlanta and gets heated from the bottom because the hot land is hotter than the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic and it's rendered unstable because the air is actually relatively cold compared to the surface. The way we indicate that is with the little letters K, and W. This means the air mass is colder than new surface, surface, and this means it's warmer, sorry, than the new surface. 
So maritime tropical air in the winter coming up over a cold surface is maritime tropical warm. I know, three letters to say one kind of air here. It's, it's from the ocean in the first place, so it's moist. It's warm, basically, but it's warmer than its new home. Uh, like, uh, say somebody from... Somebody from Atlanta moves to, um, nah, no. Somebody from uh, South Georgia moves to Atlanta. And they got a really strong Southern accent. And they come up to Atlanta where it's not that it, it's not that we have Northern accents here, but we don't have as strong an accent. So they kind of stick out by sounding more Southern than the people here. Or you could have somebody from Atlanta move to like some town in South Georgia. Now you got a Southern accent maybe already, but not like theirs. You see how the basic classification of the air mass based on its origin is not the only thing to say about it. It's also how it compares to its new home. And here's the thing. This makes the air stable. It makes it stable because it, the warm air is warmer than the new surface and the new surface chills it down so it gets where it doesn't want to go up and down anymore. We talked about that in chapter four and it becomes stable and get foggy and there's no thunderstorms. But the same air mass in the summer is actually a little bit colder than the new hot surface it passes over so that it gets unstable. And this is what our summers are all about. Our summers have all this, these thunderstorms in the afternoon, you know, because this air is cooler than us. It's like sea breeze air coming in and we're all hot. And so it's cooler than us, so it's K and then you get thunderstorms. What else can you get? Here's one you can get. You can get continental polar air. And, you know, it's cold anyway, but when it passes over a warm surface, it's especially relatively cold compared to the surface and is heated from below and becomes unstable. That is exactly what's happening in the picture in the front of the thing. See this cold, dry air, continental polar air is coming down over the lake. The lake's not, I wouldn't want to go swimming in it in the winter, but it's warmer than Canada. So it becomes continental polar cold and gets unstable. And that's these clouds you see. You might even get thunder snow. It's lake effect snow that happens. By the way, you can also have continental polar air be warmer than its neighbors if it goes over something unusually. That's not as common. Um, so again, that last little subscript refers to how it is compared to the new home. And if it's, you know, I've already said it. So let me see if there's anything left out. You know, air mass, this is an easy chapter. We talked about where air masses come from, and, and they do get modified. They don't stay the same forever. They modify in various ways. I mean, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Like, for example, um, continental polar air from Siberia can travel out across the North Atlantic, and it's been so long in, like, Ireland, I mean, like my student, it ends up picking up that accent. By the time air goes all the way from Siberia to Oregon, the people in Oregon think it came from the ocean because it kind of did. It lived there most of the time. Um, and of course, that's true for any air mass going to get modified. Some the, and in cold, very, very cold, dry air from up here, it is still relatively cold when it gets here to Georgia, but not as cold as it was. You know that. Uh, people's accents do get modified if they move around. I guess that pretty much does it for the air mass chapter. <laughs> One video for this chapter. And I will assign some questions from it. So we'll talk to you soon. Chapter 9 gets interesting. It's about fonts and stuff. We'll see you later. Bye.